and it was really a great presentation and um, it's about their orphanage in Guatemala that God is really blessing there. So um, it, it, I thought it was a really great program. Um, let's see, what else is coming up? I think most of the announcements are in there. I wanted to point out the Reformation. Oh, sign-up sheet in the, in the Narthex. There is a sign-up sheet if you can help volunteer for the bazaar. We really do need some volunteers, even if it's for just a little bit of time. It takes the weight off of those that are going to be here probably most of the day. So if you can help in any small way, it'd be really great if you could sign up and, and do that. And that's coming up on November 4th. November 4th, thank you. Um, any other announcements? Choir after church. Oh, choir after church. Don't forget about that. We're the, they're singing on Refor Reformation Sunday, so we're practicing. Jennifer? Um, thank you to everybody for the school kid supplies. We had a hundred runs for the kids. And I have nearly enough supplies that we can do 200 next year. Wow. Ooh. If you didn't hear that, Thank you for all the school supplies donated, and we packed 101 school kits, and there's enough left over that we could probably pack nearly 200 next year. So that's amazing. Thank you all for that blessing. Okay, I think that's all I have. Oh, wait. Oh, Rudy, sorry. Elders meeting tomorrow. Elders meeting tomorrow. And that's not on That's not on the schedule. It was last week. Yeah, and it's at 4th. 4.30, okay, 4.30, elders Ooh. meeting tomorrow. Yeah, um, I'm good. we're going to be gone Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and come home on Monday, so council members need to send their, I'll send an email, but council members need to send their reports by this Thursday, otherwise they're not going out. No. Council members, did you hear that? Yeah. If you have a report that you're supposed to send out, it needs to be to Carol by Thursday or else it's not going to be in the meeting. So please, please be sure to do that. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome to Grace Lutheran Church. Let us start off like... <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> No, we had somebody using this yesterday. Apparently, they turned it off, which I didn't even know there was an on and off function on this thing. <laughs> okay, so now let us do like we normally do and open up with some song.
short shoulders message. All right. So way back in the beginning, with Adam and Eve, God only gave them one command, do not eat from the tree. And they both knew it. Well, one day, Eve was out there in the garden and a snake came to her. And who was that snake? The devil. The devil, right. And the devil said, Eve, what did God tell you? Eve said, we had got, no, I'm sorry. And the devil said, look at that beautiful fruit. And Eve said, oh no, we can't eat that fruit. We can't even touch it or we'll die. And the devil lied and he said, oh no, you can eat it. And if you do it, you'll be as smart as God. Well, Eve looked at the fruit and she thought, wow, that fruit looks really delicious. And she ate it and she gave some to Adam who was with her and he ate it. And that was the very first bad thing that ever happened. That was the first sin. And, but the thing was, the fruit looked really good. It looked really yummy, but actually it was terrible. It didn't look dangerous, but it was. So what we're going to do is an experiment where something looks safe, but is really, really dangerous. All right, so here we go. All right, of course, don't do this one at home. It's got fire, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. Fire yeah. All right, so does that look dangerous? Yeah. Right, let's see. Right there. Oh, let's see. Oh, yikes. See, oh, yikes. it is dangerous. Even though it doesn't look yikes. it doesn't look dangerous, it is. Oh. All right, now we gotta actually put it out so we don't burn out the church. No. <laughs> see, so it looked dangerous, okay. it looked safe, but it was actually really dangerous because okay. actually there was fire there. Uh, that's hand sanitizer. But if you like hand, san hand sanitizer on fire, there'll actually be a flame there, but you can't see it. But if you would have touched it, it would have been really, really bad. That's why we use paper, not our hands. Yeah. <gasps> Uh, God, help us to listen to you. What you say is sin. Help us to believe it and never do it. Even if it looks fun to us, even if it looks okay, we know that if you say no, it means no. Is that what he says? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Hey, kiddos, you're not done yet. Oh. Oh. Oh, yeah, Daddy. Can you give this to Pastor? Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> there you go. Pastor Appreciation Day. We got a song for you. Yeah, we yeah. even better. We got a song. That's why you have this extra thing in the uh, bulletin today. It's the words of the song that we're going to be singing to the pastor. <laughs> confess our sins to God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. 
Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have never offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. For I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you for the marvelous mercy, and for the sake of the holy innocent and bare sufferings and death. In the stead by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Psalm today is Psalm 80. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that you may be saved. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade. The mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea. And its shoots to the river. Why then have you broken down its walls? So that all who pass along the way fall into its roof. The boar from the forest ravages it. And all that bloom in the field be on it. Turn again, O God of hosts. Look down from the bed and see. Have regard for this vine. The stock that your right hand planted, and for the son whom you made strong for your sons. They have burned it with fire. They have cut it down. They did perish at the rebuke of your face. But let your hand be on the man of your right hand. The son of man whom you made strong for your son. Then we shall not turn back from you. Give us life, and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord of hosts. Let us be shine, and we can be saved.
glory. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, you gave your sons the hand of sinful men who killed him. Forgive us when we reject your unfailing love and grant us the fullness of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. From Isaiah chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, the men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoted. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our epistle reading is from Philippians chapter 3. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a prosecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law of blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. According to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Jesus said, Hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press around it and built a tower and lent it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit draw near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When, therefore, the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and let them out to a vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and it was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and be given to people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken into pieces, but when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. This is the gospel of the Lord. Now, please join with me as we confess our common faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, the Son of our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven, and 
and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. For thence you will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and we will turn to our sermon. change are you joyfully expecting? One of the things I look forward to is seeing all the things that my kids are going to do with their lives, their career, marriage, and kids of their own. Now, some of my children have already done those things. My oldest does have a child, after all. And I've already seen my children do some of the things that I had been looking forward to. Now, I'm speaking, of course, of being potty trained and sleeping through the night. <laughs> now, though it is but a distant memory now, I remember desperately wanting those things to pass. But I guess it's good that I don't remember it very well, or at least not with the same intensity, because if I did, I might be tempted to hold it against them. But this does bring something up that I'm looking forward to, and I'm just the teeniest bit ashamed to say it. I wonder how I am going to feel when Susie 
has a kid of her own, and calls me to tell me how hard it is to go without sleep. Now, I'm going to commiserate with her, and I'll encourage her and even help her. I just hope I don't laugh at her, at least not so she can hear me. So the part of Philippians that we read about in the past, the part of the Philippians that we read about this morning is about the past, the present, and the future. Paul starts off by talking about the past, but he does so in a very peculiar manner. He brags about himself. Now, Paul did this another time in 2 Corinthians 11, but that time he directly stated, this is a foolish thing to do. And while he doesn't say it is a foolish thing to do here, it does seem like he's bragging about himself to rebuke a foolish argument. Paul wrote, if anyone thinks that he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Now that opening part says it all. If anyone thinks he has comp reason for confidence in the flesh, that is, Paul is saying that if anyone could rely on their works to be saved, it would be someone like him. If anyone can earn eternal life, it would be a man like Paul that had done so very much for God. Paul said that he was circumcised on the eighth day. That meant that not only did Paul obey the law, but even his parents did too, because they precisely obeyed the law that God had given to Moses. He said he was of the people of Israel, and that meant he was one of God's people and an heir to the covenant that God had made with him. As it is written, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possessions out of all the people on the face of the earth. Now, on a side note, now that Jesus has instituted the new covenant, all believers share in this special status. Like Peter wrote, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And Paul also wrote that he was of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, the tribe of Benjamin, like all the other tribes, had its ups and its downs, although most notably, that tribe, along with the tribe of Judah, were the only two tribes that, for the most part, remained true to God by worshiping about the one true temple in Jerusalem whereas all the other ten tribes, for the most part, resulted to worshiping idols in false temples. Paul, by saying that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, Paul was basically indicating that he was among the most faithful and hardworking Jews in the entire nation of Israel. And by the right, and by the way, he was basically right in that assessment. Paul also said, as to the law of Pharisee. And while the Pharisees could rightly be considered to be some of the main villains of the Bible, they did indeed rigorously apply themselves to obeying God's law. And Paul had done that, which his other Pharisees would have known. But then Paul moved on to something that probably caused him some pain, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. In the past, Paul had watched in approval as his fellow Israelites murdered a Christian, while he himself was said to ravish the church and enter into house after house and drag off men and women and commit them to prison. And finally, Paul said that as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Now that would seem to be his most audacious brag. Did he truly obey God's law? Well, that depends on how you define obey. <clears throat> If someone had carefully watched Paul throughout his earlier life, they may well never have seen Paul break the law, at least obviously. Paul probably never did commit adultery or worship an idol. And it seems as if to the Pharisees, that was enough. They looked like they obeyed the law. Like Jesus said about him, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. But after he was saved, Paul saw that he had never truly been righteous to the law. Indeed, the law only served to show him how sinful he was. Like Paul wrote, like Paul wrote in Romans, Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For anyone to think they have the slightest confidence in the flesh, 
that is confident in who they are and what they do, is not just nonsense, but blasphemous, and Paul knew it. This man, who had seemingly just bragged about his, all that he had done for God, also wrote, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. It reminds me of something that I read a long time ago from The Little Town on the Prairie by Laura Ingalls Wilder. From that book, Mary had always been good. Sometimes she had been so good that Laura could hardly bear it. But now she seemed different. Once Laura asked her about it. You used to try all the time to be good, Laura said, and you always were so good. It made me so mad I wanted to slap you. But now you are good without even trying. Mary stopped still. Oh, Laura, how awful. Do you ever want to slap me now? No, never, Laura said honestly. No, really and honestly, no, Mary. I'm just glad you're my sister. I wish I could be like you, but I guess I can never be. Laura sighed. I do not know how you can be so good. I'm not really, Mary told her. I do try, but if you could see how rebellious and mean I feel sometimes, you, what you could really like, if you could see what I am really like inside, you wouldn't want to be like me. I can't see what you're like inside, Laura contradicted. It shows all the time. You're always so perfectly patient and never the least bit mean. I know why you wanted to slap me, Mary said. It's because I was showing off. I wasn't really wanting to be good. I was showing off to myself what a good little girl I was and being vain and proud, and I deserved to be slapped for it. Now back to Paul. Paul sums up his thoughts about all the works of the flesh that he did in the past, and he brings us to his present life. Paul wrote, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and counted them as rubbish. Paul is saying two things here. First, he counts everything that he just bragged about as loss. And second, he seems to go even further by saying he counts them as rubbish. But what did he mean? Are all the works that we do for Jesus meaningless, or are they worse than that? Are they garbage to God as in though they offend him? But that just doesn't seem to be right. We know that good works are just that. They're good. And doing good works is essential. We are directly told to do that. For example, we are told that our faith must work through love. That is, if we truly have faith, then it will be seen in our acts of love towards one another. So instead, Paul seemed to be saying that in comparison to Jesus, everything that Paul did meant nothing. Like Paul said earlier in Philippians, Christ Jesus being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. What had Paul or anyone else ever done that could measure up to that? Certainly Paul was willing to do anything for Jesus, even give up his own life. But it was a very different thing for Paul to sacrifice himself than it was for Jesus, as we're told. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. For us to try to be righteous on our own, or try to earn eternal lives through our good works after Jesus paid for them in full on the cross, is a terrible insult to him. Calling self-justifying works like that rubbish? is being far too kind. And also, not only were the good works that Paul did useless for Paul, they were dangerous for him. Relying on works is the deadliest trap there can ever be. The circumstances into which Paul was born and the things that Paul was doing seemed to be the best way, even the only way, to earn eternal life. Paul was the best of the best, and he knew it, and so did other people. But that's the trap. Earning eternal life through works looks so possible, and it makes us look as good as possible. It's all about pride. It's elevating ourselves and devaluing God. It's saying sin, well, that's a problem other people have. <laughs> it is refusing to accept what Jesus said. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Paul 
said that he gave up everything that he built his past life upon in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends upon faith. So why did Paul count everything as a loss? Because he finally realized that what he gained from giving it up makes it look like nothing. Paul was in Jesus, and he had Jesus, and he had righteousness that comes through faith. When Paul said that he gained Jesus, it seems to be referring to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Like we're told, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And if Christ is in you, though although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. And because you are sons of God, God has sent the Son of the Spirit in your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Paul also said that he was in Jesus. Now that seems to refer to Paul being a part of the body of Jesus, as it is written. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. And now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And Paul also said, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And that is something that is attested to many parts of the Bible. Even way back in the beginning, in the book of Genesis, we're told, Abram believed the Lord and he counted to him as righteousness. Indeed, Paul having righteousness by faith is the opposite of having confidence in the flesh. Now, what Paul wrote next turns the corner from his present life to his future life. He said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain resurrection from the dead. Now, Paul surely suffered in the sufferings of Jesus because both of them were treated with the greatest cruelty to those they came to save. People accused Jesus of being in league with Satan, being insane, and of blasphemy. People tried to stone Jesus and tried to throw him off a cliff. And eventually, of course, some of the people that Jesus came to save crucified him. Paul went through similar ordeals. He was accused of causing riots, being a plague, or faking the temple. He was imprisoned more than once. People beat him with rods, made a vows to kill him, and tried to kill him, and once stoned him and left him for dead. And of course, ultimately, Paul was killed for being a follower of Jesus. But as was said, that was Paul's presence life. His future life was the resurrection from the dead. Clearly, that had not happened at the time that Paul wrote Philippians, but it most certainly would happen. And we are like Paul in that, in that we too are awaiting our resurrection. However, the first true resurrection has already come to pass. The other ones, they're going to come later, like we're told. But each in its, in its order. Christ the first fruits, then in his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. When the final resurrection happens, it seems like it's going to happen all at once for every, both the saved and the unsaved alike. Like Jesus said, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to a resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to a resurrection of judgment. And it's all going to come to pass in but a moment, like we're told. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. And we also know that there will be no more resurrections after that point, because there will be no need for it, like Paul wrote elsewhere about Jesus. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to destroy is death. And the type of body that all of us, all of us believers will receive will make what we gave up, as Paul said, to be as significant as the loss of rubbish. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in honor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Now, it is clear that Paul believed that all of that lay in his future, as he also wrote. 
Not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have already made it my own. Indeed, by focusing on his future, Paul seemed to be suggesting that he was not at all resting on the many righteous works that he had done for Jesus in the recent past and would continue to do in the present. Paul had already clearly dismissed all of those things that he had been born into and that had done before because Jesus had saved him. But by writing, I do not consider that I have made up my own, he seemed to be, Paul seemed to be saying that Paul himself could not earn what he would receive in this eternal, what he would receive in eternal life, but that Jesus did it all for him. And a part of what Jesus would do before him was that at some point Jesus was going to make Paul perfect. What an odd thing to consider. Would it be too much for us to assume that one day we are going to be perfect? In Revelation, we are told what the new earth will be like. But nothing unclean will ever enter into it, no anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So it appears like that in our, our eternal lives, we are going to be perfect in that we will never sin. So in that sense, we will be perfect. That is, we're going to be holy. Again, like Isaiah tells us, a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk the way. Even if they are fools, they shall never go astray. But while it seems like we're going to be perfect in a moral sense, and will be perfect in our bodies, we will never be perfect in power, because God alone is almighty. And then Paul ends this part by bringing the past, the present, and the future together. He says, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Our future lives, our eternal lives, are just as assured as Jesus himself is. So too are our present and past lives. That is, the sins that we have committed, and even the sins we might commit today, cannot prevent us from an inheriting what lies ahead for all of those who love Jesus. So, my beloved, I leave you with this. Answer Jesus' call to be with him now and in the future. And now, may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. And now please rise for our offertory. <laughs>
rise for the prayers of our church. And if you have anything to pray, feel free to pray it out loud during our moment of silence. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For the church, the vineyard of the Lord's planning, that by the sacrifice of Christ and the comfort of his spirit, she may yield much fruit for his kingdom. Lord, your mercy. Hear our prayers. For confidence to share the sufferings of Jesus Christ, who died to make us his own, that we may know the power of his resurrection. Lord, your mercy. Hear our prayers. For all orphans, that they would be given a safe place in which to grow and thrive, and for generous couples who will give them permanent home through adoption. Lord, your mercy. Hear our prayers. For our president, our governor, and all elected and appointed leaders, that the light of the Lord may shine upon our nation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For strong hearts to heed the pruning of the law of the Lord, that we may never presume to sin, nor trust in our own deeds, but look to the rainfall of his grace as the source of our life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For zeal directed by the gospel of the church, and hands strengthened to accomplish the fruitful work of God in this barren world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord God, we pray for Susan, who is recovering from food poisoning. Indeed, we pray that that goes away and she is not plagued by it anymore. Lord, in your mercy, hear. hear our prayers. We pray for all the hunters out there. We pray for safety for them. And if it's your will, we pray that they get some. <laughs> Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our God. prayers. And we pray for Linda, who's having knee surgery on Monday. We pray for skill for the doctors. We pray for no complications and no pain, and she is swiftly brought back to normal. Lord, your mercy, yeah. hear our prayers. And Lord Jesus, we pray for the wars around the world, like in the Ukraine and Israel. We pray that those wars come to end. We pray that no innocents suffer. Lord, your mercy, yeah. hear our prayers. We pray for an end to human trafficking. We pray that those who did it are caught and serve justice. We pray for anyone victimized it, that they are brought to restoration. And we pray that anyone that might want to indulge such a thing is convicted. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for the earthquake in Afghanistan. We pray that supplies may get to the people that need it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Merciful Lord, help us to trust your grace and wisdom and power as we await your responses to our prayers. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we turn now to the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated, and we will say, go on to our final hymn.